Hello, I'm the Reverend Nathan Stomberg, and welcome to the Lively Faith Podcast. I'm the Rector of Holy Communion Anglican Church in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, and today we're joined by the Reverend Mark Galloway, a presbyter at Holy Communion, and I think we're ready to get started. Mark, how are you doing today? I am well, thank you. Good to hear. So today we're going to be talking about Rhode Island, and is it really the most Catholic state and I think specifically one thing that some of our viewers may be aware of, others may not, is that Bishop Tobin is going to be putting in his retirement in the coming year when he turns 75. So I want to talk about that and some of the religious and cultural implications that are around it that might not be immediately evident to the average observer, let's mm-hmm. say. Um, so I think it's what is relevant to the religious landscape in the, sca- in the state, Mark, is that in the news we've seen that Pope Francis has appointed the most reverend Bishop, uh, excuse me, the most reverend Richard G. Henning as the coadjutor Bishop of Providence. So coadjutor was a new term for me. I had to look that up. A coadjutor <laughs> is a bishop appointed to assist a diocesan bishop and often also designated as his successor. He is. That's what a coadjutor is, successor to the ordinary. Right. And so one of the things that I think is a surprise for most people is that bishops have to retire. They have to submit their retirement when they turn 75. Yes, under canon law in the Roman Catholic Church, it's 75. Um, The Pope does not have to accept that resignation, uh, that retirement. He can ask the bishop to stay on for X amount of time, and they're not sure how the agreement works between uh, the Pope and the local ordinary, how long that would take. But it doesn't necessarily mean the person has to leave office. They're required to. In contrast, in the Episcopal Church, it's 70. You, You must retire as a bishop in the Episcopal Church at 70 years old. You continue to function as a bishop uh, in the House of Bishops, but you have retired status, and then you can uh, work for other bishops at their um, request and so forth. So the former Episcopal Bishop of Allen, Gerald Wolf, is an assistant to the Bishop of Long Island right now and has been for like a decade and so forth. Um, uh, bishop Jelena, who is the bishop in the 70s uh, and into the 90s in Rhode Island, um, is still alive. And he's, he's close to 100 years old, I think. But he's continued to do ministry to his capacity um, since his retirement 15, more than 15 years ago. Right, right. So I think before we get into Bishop Tobin and his eventual replacement, I want to take a step back and look again at, okay, why should we care? You and I, we're both Anglicans, and then as far as who may be listening to this podcast, we are hoping that people from all different denominational backgrounds will be listening, whether it's uh, Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic or Anglican or Evangelical or, or Protestant. So I think when the topic of Catholic bishops come up, people may be tempted just to tune it out or to not give it much of a second thought. But why, I think there's two questions here. Why would a Catholic, a Roman Catholic, care about the replacement of a bishop? Because I think plenty of people don't know who their bishop is. And then the second is, why should non-Catholics care about who the bishop is in their local area? Well, those are really important questions, especially in the context in which we live uh, in, in contemporary society. In Rhode Island's history, especially in the last hundred years, and other than the governor and maybe uh, for the average citizen who uh, a maybe not both U.S. senators, but at least one of the U.S. senators most people would know, who they were. So when I was growing, everybody knew who John Chafee was. He was yeah. a senator, right? And Claiborne Pell. Um, they might not know who the the United States House of Representatives members were, 
But other than the governor, the Catholic bishop was the second most, or maybe even the most identifiable person in the state. And it had to do because Rhode Island was the most Catholic state in the United States. And other than a politician, the governor, and other high-ranking um, politicians at state and federal level, pronouncements of a Catholic bishop would have been uh, more readily available. And, and the media was much more uh, streamlined, obviously. Uh, the Providence Journal Bulletin was the disseminator of most all information to Rhode Islanders from the state level for decade after decade after decade. So uh, Catholic bishops had tremendous influence over the state, over its cultural milieu, over its moral precepts. Uh, Forty years ago, what a Catholic bishop thought would have heavily influenced the Rhode Island General Assembly, um, and those things have all waned in incremental measurements since the mid-60s. Today, I would agree that, I don't know what the percentages are, but lots of Roman Catholics would know who the bishop was and probably did, it doesn't register and affect their life one iota. Right. Um, you know, kind of a secondary conversation. There's always been two bishops in Rhode Island. There used to be a, a magazine that used to come out with the Providence Journal in the 70s and 80s it's called the Rhode Islander. Hmm. It used to be tucked into it. And I remember it had an article on uh, Bishop George Hunt, uh, the Episcopal Bishop of Rhode Island. This would have been in um, the mid-80s or so. And it was called The Other Rhode Island Bishop. Huh. And... Um, and just to give a contrast, at the height of the Episcopal Diocese's size, it had about 35,000 members in like 70 parishes and missions. And it was the second largest denomination in Rhode Island to the Roman Catholic Church, which had 650,000 baptized wow. members. So that's how massive the dichotomy was, right? And then all the other Protestant groups, the American Baptists and the United Church of Christ, all went in descending order and smaller size than the Episcopal Diocese. Mm -hmm. So that's how dominant the culture was and why the Catholic bishop was and has been such a prominent figure in Rhode Island culture. Oh, thanks for sharing that. I also even personally wasn't aware of the full history behind it. And I think I would add to the other side of that conversation for the Protestant listener or the evangelical Protestant listener um, and for those on the other side of the Tiber as well, our, um, our Orthodox listeners, we, we, we tend to tune out from the things that maybe don't impact us directly. But for us on this podcast, we affirm that Roman Catholics are our brothers and sisters in Christ, as are Anglicans, as are Evangelicals, as are our Orthodox brothers and sisters. As long as you hold to historic Orthodox creedal Christianity as affirmed in the Nicene and Apostles' creeds, then we don't hold that animosity between us just for purely uh, denominational reasons. And so that's really why, from a local context, people should care about who replaces Bishop Tobin, because Bishop Tobin was a very bold and brave defender of the Orthodox Christian faith as it was put forth by the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bishop Tobin, uh, I admire Bishop Tobin tremendously. I have had correspondence with Tobin in my role as a bishop in our small fledgling Anglican uh, efforts here in Rhode Island. Um, it strikes me, you know, this recently there's an article in the Providence Journal about this transition, and it, it just baffles me. Well, it doesn't really baffle me because I know why it happens, but uh, there's always the rider on Bishop Tobin, the controversial Bishop it's Thomas. Always Tobin. the controversy. Right, and, and it strikes me that the current Episcopal Bishop of Rhode Island, um, Bishop Nisley, Nicholas Nisley, who's been in office since 2012, he's never referred to as a controversial figure, right? Um, 
Bishop Tobin's controversial because he actually defends what the catechism of the Catholic Church teaches. And I think it's very telling that when a bishop comes out and says practically verbatim what the Catholic Church teaches, that's the controversial part. Right. Why is, why is that controversial? He's just saying something that's true. Yeah, well, it's controversial because of this tremendous sociological, sociopolitical transformation we've seen in the state in the last 50 years, right? Um, the, the media wouldn't have dared say such a thing about a Catholic bishop 50 years ago, right? Um, but, I mean, the reason really isn't rocket science or really that difficult, it seems to me, for us to grasp intellectually, is that the reason why Thomas Tobin is controversial is because a majority, and probably a vast majority, of his flock doesn't believe what the Catholic Church teaches. Yeah. And so the media in Rhode Island is saturated with, quote, Catholics, at least in theory, right? These are yes. baptized people. They, they are unlikely to be practicing the Catholic faith in any substantial way. The General Assembly is full of baptized Catholics who defy Catholic teaching in virtually every policy that they support. And so uh, Bishop Tobin's a wonderful foil, isn't he? He is, and for, I think for them, he, I think he's, he's controversial. We're not. Yeah, we're but we but we're still we're good Catholics, we're good people, right? As if they their own self conscious and and their own opinion determines truth, as opposed to the fact is that the Church believes truth immutable. Yes, reveal the natural law by God the revelation of the scriptures in the, in the teaching tradition of the church. Right. And that, that information you'll never hear anywhere in the media. Never. Uh, maybe in this podcast. Um, and not, quite frankly, uh, not even from the pulpits of Catholic churches in this state. Sadly, you no. You won't hear it. Uh, so I'd like to read part of that Providence Journal article for some context, especially for those who maybe not live in Rhode Island, but I think it's, it's also interesting. It really makes the point into how the narrative is built around him. So Tobin is known, this is the Providence Journal article, for being staunchly anti-abortion. He has criticized Catholic politicians who support abortion rights, such as President Joe Biden and previously barred former U.S. Rep. Patrick Kennedy right. from receiving communion because of his stance on abortion. Very few bishops or ordained people anywhere. A handful in the country. So such a small number are willing to administer that type of church discipline when it is called for. And I think the most recent example is the controversy over politicians like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi with the, um, who was that bishop? It was at San Ca Francisco. Caldeon in, in yeah. San Francisco, right, bought her in. In his diocese, his archdiocese, she's not bought. She right. might be in Rhode Island if she came to, right now at least, if she came to Rhode Island by Bishop Tobin. Um, but she's not barred in the archdiocese of Washington, D.C., for instance. Exactly. The Cardinal Archbishop made it clear that those such things weren't going to be part of the discipline in the archdiocese of Washington. So, um, so I think that's an aside, but there's other, I think, interesting guideposts along the way from Tobin's time as bishop in Rhode Island. His outspoken commentary on Twitter, the article goes on, has repeatedly mm -hmm. generated headlines and backlash. Earlier this year, I liked when he did this, upon learning that Ali's Donuts yes. was collecting donations for Planned Parenthood, yes. Tobin suggested that Catholics and others concerned about protecting human life might want to buy their donuts elsewhere. Yes. In 2019, he drew national... Well, let's, let's talk about that oh, for a second. Oh, sure. Right? So you, Right. Allie's is one of those landmarks. If you're any age, you know where Allie's is even, your yeah. generation, right? So my, that's like uh, saying to my generation where the local Benny's was. Remember the Rhode Island tent? Remember you took a left at the Exo station? Everyone like, loves like, Allie's. I love Allie's. Right. But the, the fact is what, what Bishop Tobin said is what every regenerate Christian should do. Right? If you're serious about your Christian faith, you're serious 
about God's revelation. You're serious about the sacredness of life. That's how we should approach all areas of our life, where we shop, what we purchase, how we present ourselves as followers of the cross. The idea that it's controversial is just ludicrous. You know, instead of saying, wow, what a brave, faithful soldier who is upholding his office as a successor to the apostles. That's what should be said about Tobin, at least from his flock, and at least from other clergymen, regardless of your denomination, if you're really regenerate. But the liberal liberals, both in, within Catholicism and certainly liberal progressive Protestants, they love the idea of beating on Bishop Tobin because it just adds to their whole perception of their own self-righteousness about yeah. these issues. Right, right. And, it, and for them, in a sense, he's, he's an easy target for them because he's so outspoken. He's really the target. What other target is there? Really, there's, there's no other targets right. in, in I this mean, state, The Episcopal so Bishop speak. is going to go along with all of these things, right? Yeah. He's, which, ironically, because, you know, for, for instance, the Episcopal Bishop in all the Protestant leaderships, the, the conference ministers of the American Baptist Conference or the United Church of Christ, they, they don't ever got any attention at all in the media because in any way, any significant way, they don't move the public needle in any direction because they're just part of the mainstream opinion about everything, right? That they don't challenge the culture for the gospel in any specific way. They sound like a pack group for the Democratic National Convention. So Bishop Tobin is it, you know? And I think for those of us who aren't Roman Catholics and so admire him, and I think there's a significant number of ministers and uh, a few of us priests of, um, on the Anglican side and a few evangelicals that admire Bishop Tobin because he has been that moral voice, much like I would argue popes have been until the current one. Um, certainly John Paul II and Benedict XVI internationally have been the last stalwart bastions of a moral voice in the world. Right. Right. And, and you know, it used to be an old saying when I was growing up and going through early years of ministry, uh, when the Catholic Church sneezes, Protestants get a cold. I've heard that before. Yes, and that's, and that's no longer the case. Um, and, and because most of, you know, our tradition has a hierarchy and we have you know, bishops, presbyters, priests, and deacons, and, uh, but most of the Protestant establishment without that type of ecclesiology is often lacking that singular voice that can speak for um, the, the church in a local area on a single issue. And so it just baffles me how this man has been treated. And it won't be pretty here in these months leading up to his retirement. Yeah, and I, he alluded to that in his interview where they were asking him about whether or not he expected it to, his resignation to be, or his retirement to be accepted right away. And he expects that it will. But then he added that, well, I think I'd rather be a dead duck than a lame duck yeah, in this he, situation. He, he deals with it very clever and gracious with uh, his responses. Because he's no, I think Bishop Tobin always is aware that any question asked him by the media is a loaded question, right? It's not a sincere question. Uh, I'm sure they're all concerned about his future well-being and, <laughs> and how he's doing spiritually and yeah. all of those things. Um, yeah, I think that's a good answer on his part. But I have no doubt uh, that this, how this has happened, I think you and I talked about this in, in, even a year ago. You would ask the question, you know, when Bishop Tobin comes to retirement age, what would you say is going to happen? And I said, well, th there's no moderate or left a right of center replacement coming from Rome for Bishop Tobin in Rhode Island. and. Uh, and the reason being, just for what that article said, he's, he's been labeled by the media and by the Catholic 
media establishment as being a group of maybe maybe a dozen to 20 um, bishops out of a couple hundred Catholic bishops in the country that hold their ground on the very things they took right. ordination vows to, to stand for. And um, they're a small club these days. Uh, and the media knows who they are, and they're controversial, uh, but the progressive bishops of Cardinal Supic of Chicago, who's a progressive across the screen, he's not a controversial figure. It, right? It's just hypocrisy of an assessment of of uh, the episcopate in the in the Catholic Church. And I think it's important to qualify, in all fairness, that. We, we need to reserve full judgment until the guy, the new guy, actually does take office. That's part of being charitable. Yeah, but, think, but thinking through it from a logical position, we've covered how controversial Bishop Tobin is, according to his commentators, and presumably in the mind of and eyes of Pope Francis. So it wouldn't make any sense for him to appoint someone who was seen as equally or even close to being controversial. And that really answers the question of, will he be as conservative as Bishop Tobin? And they asked this question of um, Bishop Henning in their press conference, and I think his answer says it all. I think he answered it in sort of a deflecting manner. But when he was asked that question, he did not give any indication that he shares Tobin's stances and did not express any disagreement with Pope Francis's beliefs. And he gives a very party line answer here. Do I in any way dissent from him? The answer is when it comes to Catholic teaching, no, I do not. But the Holy Father doesn't expect us to be automatons, right? He said, adding that he sees it as his duty to pray and exercise leadership and to do so according to my conscience. Now, none of the words that he said there are wrong, but there's a lot of ambiguity right. in the answer that he gave. Right. And every Catholic bishop, we, we've talked about this, the difference between uh, our two traditions, as much as they are our cousins, and the, sim the closest cousins in the West out of the Reformation, um, a, a priest's obedience to his bishop and the diocese is absolute. A bishop's obedience to the pope is absolute. Um, you know, in the Anglican tradition, we have much looser connections mm -hmm. in those things, and we have different rights. For instance, in the Episcopal diocese, you know, in any Episcopal diocese, so you're a rector of our church. If we were in an Episcopal diocese, once you're, t once you're an installed, an inducted rector, the bishop cannot remove you other than for canonical impediment. So the bishop just can't come to you and say, Father Nathan, we're moving you to St. Swithburn's. The bishop doesn't have that authority in the Episcopal Church. Um, that's not the case in a, uh, in a Catholic diocese. A bishop's power is absolute. They can move you in a day uh, for whatever reason they deem appropriate. And part of your obedience to the bishop is that you accept those conditions under which you live. And so it's the same thing of a, a bishop's relationship to the pope. Um, so it's, so, so, you know, Bishop Tobin and his relatively small band of brothers who have, I think, charitably and appropriately reminded the Bishop of Rome at times that that position you're asking me to uh, support contradicts the standing teaching of the Catholic Church both in the magisterium and the catechism of the church, and it, and it uh, contradicts my vows I took to you and your successor and to my ordination. Um, the media and the average pew sitter doesn't care about those things. No. It doesn't even come to their purview of what's, in, what's important, right? And uh, certainly the abortion issue in Rhode Island is the paramount example of this, is that, uh, you know, Bishop Tobin, as a Catholic bishop should be. It's, it is the most important moral issue of our time. And um, Rhode Island, with the most Catholic population, is, is so blatantly pro-abortion 
that it's staggering. Yeah, and I want to dig into that a little more. I think first and foremost, we should continue as we always should to pray for the new bishop and those who are put into positions of church leadership, no matter what denomination that we're in. So we're not implying that we want his tenure to be unsuccessful. Oh, of course not. But this is just the reality of how things are when we're talking about the facts of Christian doctrine and, and Roman yeah. Catholic doctrine. If you read that article, not to interrupt you, uh, Bishop Henning gave his hand away in that article when you read it. That he, he says, you know, he actually mentions separation of church and state. Yes, he and does. And that he's not going to be involving himself. Right. Uh, like, you don't, so you, don't, you don't have to be, um, you have to be pretty naive not to know what that really means, right? He's not going to be censoring pro-abortion Catholic politicians. Yeah, right? and I have his quote it's right not, here. It's not going to happen. He says, um, <clears throat> Henning also said he is open to meeting with Rhode Island state officials, <laughs> but believes in the separation of church and state. I would not imagine, he said, I'm going to somehow influence public officials. They have their very important and necessary role to do. I certainly pray for them every day. I know these are difficult times. I also, uh, so that's the end of the quote, but as Christians, why would you not want to influence well, public it, officials? Uh, you know, having served as a bishop in the smallest of settings compared to a, a bishop of Rhode Island, it's your job to influence your sheep with the truth, right? That's, that's what we're called to do as priests and bishops. We're to guide the flock. Now, the idea that just because you've been elected to public office, all of a sudden you're exempt from that influence, to me it's, it makes no sense whatsoever. You don't operate in a vacuum. And as Christians, Roman Catholic and otherwise, if you're not interested in influencing a group of people with the gospel, then what are you wasting your time doing? Well, as a, as a, as a Roman Catholic, just as any form of Christian, but it, you know, specifically as a Roman Catholic, if you're a politician, it should be your faith that should paramount influence your moral decisions. Otherwise, what does your faith do? What, what, what's the point of your faith if it's not influencing your moral decision-making? Um, you might even it, call that a lively faith. Very, exactly. And so the, the notion that a bishop's saying it's not my job to influence all of my sheep in how they make moral decisions, to me, is just an utter contradiction to being a bishop. And it, it, this is another aside, but it really ties into the widespread public misconception about the First Amendment and the idea that the separation of church and state is in the Constitution, which is not, and we've talked about this many times, and that really freedom of speech, freedom of religion is supposed to confine that religion and those beliefs within the privacy of your church, if not your own home. Yes. As you know, I just taught a course on civics and, uh, and had a conversation with a PhD college professor and as you know, I constantly ask rhetorical questions to classes I've taught, you suffered through them. Um, so I asked them, is that phrase in the Constitution? And this PhD readily admitted he wasn't very really up to date on certainly the Bill of Rights, but he goes, oh, ab absolutely. I go, no, it's not. It's not in the Constitution. I said, Article One uh, says that the the country shall not establish a state church, but that, but that faith, religion, has an appropriate and a rightful place in the marketplace. And all influences of ideas in commerce and in politics. Um, it's an utter falsity, this notion that, that uh, we shouldn't expect our elected officials to bring their faith into their public office. Um, so if you're a devout Jew or a devout evangelic or a Catholic or an Anglican or, or a Muslim, whatever, when you vote for them, you should expect and you should encourage them to do so. That's what the founding fathers expected of people who 
brought their whole persona and character into public office. Today, the average Rhode Islander American, they think it's just the opposite, that somehow you're supposed to be those things in your private life, but be some secular automaton in, in the chamber of the Senate of the House, right? Um, like a statue or a widget or something. Well, remember when, um, what's the name of the female, the Catholic female that's on the, on the Supreme Court? Now, um, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. Amy Coney Barrett came up, and uh, I think it was Ma it was a Max it was a Maxine Waters. It was Barbara Boxer, the senator from California, in the uh, interrogation process of becoming, said to her, "Your dogma lives deep in you, doesn't it?" Which is such a ludicrous and insulting question. Well, yes, I'm a devout Catholic. My dogma should live deep in me. And I doubt Ms. Boxer would have said the same thing to a devout Jew that was being interviewed for the Supreme Court. Certainly, what if we had a Muslim that was sitting before the Senate? Do you think any, any United States Senator would ever say such a statement to a Muslim? Gosh, no. Absolutely not. Never. They wouldn't do it for political correct reasons and for the fallout, right? Because you'd be charged with you know, being anti-Islam and all these things. But Ms. Barrett was free fodder for them, right? And it just sums up all this hypocrisy and this utter um, distortion of the First Amendment. Yeah, I think there's this belief that what you believe needs to be segregated from how you act. So actually a dead faith is what is encouraged because it's just how you feel on the inside and you keep it within yourself and it's okay if you like God and you like Jesus so long as it doesn't influence anything else that you do in your life. Right, it's an impossibility. It, that, that's what's so illogical about it, right? So if you're, if you're a convicted atheist and you've been babbling on about that your whole political career, you bring in atheistic philosophy into all your decision making. But that's perfectly okay, right? There's, no, there's nothing controversial right. about that. You're just it's still a philosophy. Everybody believes something, and they believe those beliefs into the decision making process. Now, I would argue that atheistic philosophy is based on the idea that human existence is nothing, it has no moral significance has no eternal significance at all and somehow that's a superior way to go about making political decisions for the welfare of the common good as opposed to the judeo-christian philosophy which built which built all of western civilization all of jurisprudence all of human rights it's it's craziness right it's not yeah. from an academic standpoint it's it's foolishness the idea that those things you can get to that point and consider those things to be congruent. Exactly, and it all goes back to the idea and the understanding of worldview and what worldview is, and knowing that no matter who you are or what you believe, you have a worldview that is how you interpret things around you, and that influences how you act. And that goes back to our purpose in having this podcast in the first place is that forming and developing a Christian worldview consistent with the tradition that you are brought up in, and even more importantly, the tradition of the historic Christian church is essential for the Christian faith to go forward in the country that we live in today, because what we're seeing all around us is competing worldviews that are crowding out Christianity because Christians are not trained to think through how to apply their faith to every day, just every day. Right. Uh, you know, the, that term tradition, right? So you think, so you and I have a, an understanding of tradition, and we talked about it last week with our brother Corey. God bless him today and his work. Corey is studying for canonical exams today, so he could not be with us. Um, 
But from a Catholic perspective, with either a big or a small C, and the universal church's understanding of tradition is what's been passed on to us. As St. Paul says to the Corinthians, I passed on to you what I received. Right? That's what the tradition of the church is. We're passing on what Jesus passed on, the apostles, the apostles passed on to the new generation, primarily through the bishops, through the councils of the church, to the current day, right? even in all of our dysfunction and, and our division. Um, but let's just think, for instance, of our, of our Puritan brethren who came to this country. They came here with a tradition, mm -hmm. right? And were the dominant force in America, right? Mm -hmm. The Mass Bay Colony, Mass, Connecticut, the state church was a congregational church. Uh, they were reformed Calvinists, right? Well, their modern successors are the United Church of Christ, right? There's no continuity in that tradition. In no. fact, the, the modern United Church of Christ doesn't even believe in the tradition that came to this country that built Puritanism and a, a whole bunch of the foundational stones of representative government in American democracy. Right? They have a whole different progressive philosophy that contradicts all of that. Yeah. That's not a tradition. It's not a living tradition, nor is it a living faith or a lively faith, right? It's an invention of the last 50 years of progressive evolution, secular thought that now dominates how the church speaks to issues, right? They, uh, this happened several Several years ago, when I was living in Sterling, Connecticut, five years ago, there's a little UCC church. I had to pass on my way there. And the United Church of Christ actually made this pronouncement. In it, but it, they had a banner on each church. It said, God's still speaking through us. And they literally made the announcement that revelation is continuing in the church, which is heresy. Yeah. Right? There's no such thing as continuing revelation in the church. We're simply custodians of what's already been revealed uh, once and for all, right? When the, when the canon of scripture was closed, revelation, as the church understood it, was complete, right? Um, it's, it's very similar to what the Mormons believe about the president of, of oh, the sure. Church of Latter-day Saints, right? That the, the prophet speaks, this continuing revelation going through the prophet and that it's authoritative. So it's an ongoing layering of tradition and authority of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, it's utterly unchristian. What it's, it's not reconcilable to history in any sense, that little statement by uh, the United Church of Christ. God's continuing to reveal through us. Isn't that interesting? A little teeny group of people, God's going to continue to reveal truth through you. Right? Yeah, why, and why would he choose you in the first place? What evidence do you have to back that? None. Not, well, other than democratic vote, because that's how truth is determined, right? Uh, you've heard me say it many times. Uh, so it's just inevitable eventually uh, in what, if they survive another 30 years, which I don't think they will do, mainline Protestant churches will vote out the Trinity because it's certainly oppressive, a godhead that's based on patriarchy. And so once you can get 51% to agree that uh, the Trinity is outdated and is oppressive, I guess it will cease to exist. <laughs> so the, the truth that God's eternal and unchanging from before time and forever will go out of existence because a tiny group of Americans voted God out of existence. And it'll just disappear. I think it's so important to reiterate what you just said, that truth is not determined by a democratic majority. And it is so easy to fall into that temptation, whether it's church or whether it's political and public life, where people in positions of leadership are tripped into thinking or they buy into the idea that because a majority of people support my position, regardless of what has been believed for hundreds of years, if not millennia before, this must be what has always been true because the majority of people support it. And that, that just isn't true. And that also speaks on the other side of the coin 
to the difficulty and the importance of the Christian task to hold fast to eternal truths and historic truths that have been always taught by the church throughout millennia, that those truths don't change regardless of what public opinion says about them. It's impossible. They're impossible to change because God, God cannot lie. God cannot ever reveal truth and then change his mind. So we're just at 40 minutes then. We'll, we'll take a break and we'll finish that thought afterwards. So okay. thank you for listening. We will be right back. All right, so we're back from our break. We were just talking about in our discussion how truth is not dictated by public opinion. And speaking of public opinion, there were a couple of recent surveys that came out that I think really indicate everything that we were just talking about with respect to claiming to be of the Christian faith and not living in a way that is consistent with what that faith has historically believed. So while we're on the topic of the Roman Catholic Church, we're going to start with a Pew Research survey, Mark. And I think this has been widely known, and it was reinforced by this recent Pew survey, which is a couple years old now, hmm. that Rhode Island is still the most Catholic wow. state in the U.S. 42% of adults identify as Catholic in Rhode Island, which is the highest proportion of any state. It's not the most numerically I think for, uh, of oh, course, obviously oh, we've got, we're a very small state, but there are some caveats with that because you would think, okay, most Catholic state, then Rhode Island should be wicked religious, you know? Wicked religious. Wicked religious. Yeah. Yeah. But as we were saying, most people don't actually live in accordance with Catholic doctrine. For example, according to this Pew survey, 67% of Rhode Island Catholics do not believe in an absolute standard for right and wrong. That's just baseline stuff. We're not even getting into the stuff that is considered political. And 57% believe abortion should be legal in most all cases. 77% say homosexuality should be accepted. So these are people in Rhode Island who identify with the Catholic faith. Now let's take them, go back to the first one. Let's just take them in pieces, uh, just kind of... Um, Absolute standard for right and wrong. 57%? 67%. 67%. How do you learn? What, what voices influence you to come to that conclusion, right? I would argue it's overwhelmingly public education that has uh, done that to uh, the average person in Rhode Island. Though that's a large spectrum of age that we're looking at. That now I would suspect that skews as you go lower down the age bracket, right? Yes. That it becomes more and more open to this idea. There's no absolute truth, but still, it's not a failure from the pulpit and in, in the catechesis of the church to teach it in an effective enough way where it actually has ever resonated in people's lives. Right. I mean, that's just there's no other way. It's just we're wasting our time. Um, coming up with reasons why baptized confirms people don't believe anything. Right. And I think it lends itself to the idea that truth can be dictated by majority opinion. Oh, if there's no absolute standard for right and right. wrong. And, and, and if there's any pushback to your lifestyle or your family's culture, you assimilate into, you know, like all the Borg, you assimilate into. Uh, the cultural norm because it just makes your life easier in that your faith doesn't mean more than public opinion. Yes, and that speaks to what has long been the predominant reality in Rhode Island, that Catholic identification really is cultural more than it is religious or theological. And perhaps it's become easier for many people to say that they're Catholic because Catholic belief has been co-opted by majority public opinion. So it's still uncontroversial in a sense to claim that you're Roman Catholic in Rhode Island because you don't believe anything that challenges the norm. Well, it's perfectly acceptable. In fact, that's how to get elected and to move on in business and in any social endeavor. 
uh, that's how it is, right? Uh, in, in fairness to, to Rhode Island, it's it's not a to me it's not a, a it's not a star on your shoulder for being noble. But this is the case in other places too. So, for instance, if we lived in Atlanta, Georgia, um, two percent of the population is Roman Catholic. So the predominant culture with its uh, long roots in the antebellum south would be Presbyterianism and now Southern Baptists, right, of, of those who would claim to be religious, right? But their influence on their culture isn't a whole lot different. If you broke down all these type of surveys in a culture like uh, metropolitan Atlanta, you would come up with very similar numbers right. than you do in Rhode Island. So it's not, it's not that we're here in this podcast picking on um, people of historic Catholic immigrant ancestry. We're, di we're just talking about demographic realities, about what we claim as opposed to how we actually live out what we claim to believe. And so I think that's a really important thing to remember. Yeah. That we're unique because we're the most Roman Catholic place. Atlanta would be unique because it's the most evangelical place, right? But it, it, that doesn't make... Uh, Atlanta, Atlanta is not a bastion of conservative political philosophy, right? In fact, it sways religions. It, it, it sways um, elections in the state of Georgia because it has the most population. Yeah, it doesn't make one inherently better than the no, other. No, not at all. And yeah. it's important to realize that these trends aren't specific to one particular denomination. And I'm sure Corey no. would say the same of our Orthodox oh, brothers and absolutely. sisters as absolutely. well. Absolutely, and it's a little less so because uh, Orthodoxy has not been assimilated into American culture to the extent that other religions, and yeah. because they come from places in the world, they still bring deep ethnic uh, culture from their, their language and their traditions and so. But with every ensuing generation, that elastic band gets stretched more and more, and members of orthodoxy intermarry and eventually the same processes happen to every group. It's true, of, it's true not of just of religious groups, but it's true of ethnic groups. Hmm. Um, the Chinese who have come to America uh, and other people from the Orient have assimilated quickly into the American middle class and into the, in the echelon of intellectual society. And that's the great nature and the great um, gifts of a free capitalistic society. That's why they want to come here. It's part of the American dream. Absolutely. And so uh, the challenge of, of, of Christian identity, especially those who came from the old world to the new world to stay intact and be consistent with the long tradition of the church is such a great challenge in America. Because the greatest religion in America isn't Judeo-Christianity. It is secular religion of America itself. Yes. That is, that is the religion of America. And that's where Christians, I think, are becoming increasingly mindful, but have fallen short lately in, you can call it the culture wars if you want. I would say, as I like to say, going forth with a lively faith, the idea that secularism isn't just a neutral thing, and it's not even purely secular now. It is, as you said, a secular religion, and so when confronted with opposition from forces outside of the church, what you're really witnessing is a religious battle. Oh, absolutely, it's, it's a social, intellectual, and civil war going on. And so you hear this phrase thrown out by uh, one particular party predominantly, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And that is another <laughs> idea that has really taken hold in culture, the idea of a progressivist vision of history, that history is always moving forward and it can never move backward. And by moving forward, it means moving forward with developments that are consistent with a liberal progressive ideology. And so the phrase that gets quoted, I don't know who coined it so often, is that the arc of history is long and it is bent toward justice. And so it's this idea that things are always going to get better, and by better it means in alignment with moral and socially liberal policies. 
but that isn't true of history. No, absolutely not true of history. And it's not true of human nature, right? And it's, again, but if you, that notion's utterly and constantly reinforced by public education, public media, and public conversation, it becomes part of the DNA of how the average American thinks. And so they think that the average person is good. By nature, they're inclined to good. Uh, human civilization is always moving to improvement and to betterment, right? I mean, how can you even read history of the 20th century and come to that conclusion? Right, right. and that's it, only 100 short years. Right, World War I, World War II, Korea, the Cold War, uh, the, the, the real and pandemic on America, the abortion pandemic, all of these things that oh, we're all just moving right towards the greater good, right? And again, for, for a Christian who believes in revelation and the mutability of God's revelation of himself, the incarnate word, and in the scriptures themselves, we know from the scriptures that human history is moving to a conclusion that is not that way. Right. right. It's moving to a, a conclusion of destruction because human greed and sin will always lead to that and unchecked without repentance and obedience to uh, the sovereign God of the universe you're going to lead to your own annihilation exactly popular message yeah yeah we're so popular man <laughs> yes we yes. only we only say the most popular things on this show of right. course but it's the the idea of Christian eschatology eschatology revealed in revelation that the end point of history is the arrival of christ who is coming again to judge the living and the dead and between now and then some good things will happen some bad things will happen right. but on the whole especially for christians things can be expected to get worse before they get better oh there'll just still be an ebb and flow to the course of history there always there always is because there's always saints battling in the marketplace too. And yeah. So there's victories and there's losses and all of those things. But our eyes and our hope isn't even in any of those things. Right. And they shouldn't be. Um, unfortunately, they are in many parts of, of the Christian world, you know. What was, what was the other things I was supposed to know something about? We'll, we'll get to those things. <laughs> I think it's also important for us to remember that it's so easy for us, to your point, to get discouraged when we fix our gaze on our singular moment in history, that things aren't going the way that we wanted them to go. And on the one end, you've got the end point of history, which is Christ coming again, which is what our hope is in. But then on the other hand, that what we're going through with the Christian experience is not unique. Even going back to the Old Testament, you were just talking about the transformation of individual cultures and traditions and assimilation into the American experiment. The big fancy word for that is syncretism, and right. that goes, that's goes that been a problem with the Christian faith going all the way back to the Israelites yes. living amongst pagan nations yes. and something that they constantly had to battle against, the syncretism, the idea that you have to guard against taking on these ungodly aspects of the nations whom you live amongst. Yeah, absolutely, and it has been, right? You're right, from um, Old Testament times, you know, St. Paul had to deal with that with the early Christians, you know, uh, assimilating uh, to the Greek gods and to the Roman philosophy of his day. And it, no, it's nothing new under the sun. No. And it's just, it, they just, it just gets repackaged. It's like heresy. There's no new heresies. They just all repackaged Babylon from previous centuries and generations. Speaking of heresy, did you know that Arianism is making a comeback? Oh, it's good. It never seems to go away, does it? It's timeless. Yes. So we were speaking of the Pew Research survey about Catholicism. There was actually a very recent survey conducted by Lifeway in conjunction with Ligonier <laughs> Ministries called the State of Theology. And this was done in 2022, and the report was just released. And this was a survey conducted amongst people who identified as evangelicals, as strong Christians, people who go to church regularly. And 
yet the results are really shocking. So these are non-Catholic. These are non-Catholic. Uh, so, so we're right. going to look at some results from non-Catholic mm -hmm. Christians, from evangelicals specifically. Okay. And what is instructive for us is that the trends are all the same. Human nature is the same, regardless of what tradition you belong to. So the big one that's been published the most right now is that almost three out of four respondents, that 73% of evangelicals surveyed, agreed with the claim that Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God, which is Arianism at its finest. It is. Uh, <laughs> the problem is, the average evangelical doesn't have any idea what Arianism was. They, they no, and no I idea. think that's broadly across the American Christian spectrum yeah. as, as well. Oh, absolutely, and that would be true of all the denominations, but it's a heresy. Yes. Right? And for a group of brethren who claim sola scriptura, or scriptures alone dictate their conscience and their beliefs and so forth and so on. I don't know how you can read the prologue to John, right, the first 14 verses of John's gospel and come to the idea that Jesus was created. It's, it's impossible to reconcile. Right. You know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and was with God, right? It's like um, Jesus is the incarnate word who's he, he has no beginning and no end. He's the Alpha and the Omega. And um, it's utter ignorance. But this is what you get when you have a pastor who is authority to himself, whose only authority is his interpretation of Scripture, regardless of his acumen. Right. It becomes a position based on personality and charisma in a lot of circumstances and not so much formal training. Exactly, or any, any, not even a clue of what Mother Church has been through since Jesus' ascension and what, how the Church came to her conclusions about the truth of Christology. Yes. Right, and so, the Arian controversy raged for two centuries, and it didn't end with the, with the proclamation of the Nicene Creed. There remained Arian bishops for another hundred years after the Nicene Creed. Of course, the Nicene Creed made it clear Jesus is not created. He and the Father of the same substance, homo ustius, uh, which for evangelicals is controversial in itself because it's not a biblical term, it's a theological term the church used to to define the church's teaching about biblical truth and the truth of what has been passed on to the church, as St. Paul has said. The Father and the Son are the same substance, the uncreate, God of God, light from light, true God of true God. Right? So Arianism is utter heresy. If, if, God is, if Jesus is created, then he can't be the eternal son of God. Exactly. You cannot have trinity. You can't have the perfect symbiotic relationship, a perfect love between the three persons of the Godhead. And I think the, and that's absolutely right, and I think the interesting way to read this particular question is not in that the evangelicals surveyed believe in Arianism as a doctrine, Okay, but they don't know what it is. But they don't know what it is, and so they were able to be misled by the way the question was worded. It was worded in such a way that it, it sounded like a good thing. It sounded like a definitive statement, and it's like, yes, okay, that sounds right. And in all charity to those people, if they were corrected on such a thing, I would be willing to believe that they would see where the correction lies. But that's that's just where the issue is, that their, their teaching whatever they may have received, was divorced from the historical tradition of and the theology of the universal church. Yeah, I've had this conversation hundreds of times with men I, I admire, um, certainly have been friends with uh, in evangelical circles, uh, about the whole um, the chicken and the egg 
question, right? What becomes, what comes first, the church or the scriptures, right? And the answer is always the scriptures with, with evangelical brothers. And of course, it's just the opposite. The church yeah. comes first. The church is born at Pentecost, right? And the scriptures are a long process of being written, revealed by God to people, written down the church, codifying them through uh, liturgical use and counsel, and eventually uh, they come to their conclusion. And you, you're well aware that the church doesn't come to consensus for the first time on the 27 writings that we believe to be in the New Testament until St. Athanasius is listed in 367. That's almost four centuries after the birth of Christ, right? Yeah. Meanwhile, the Nicene Creed had already been written 45 years before that. Right. Right, so the church already had decided the Arian controversy in, in an official capacity, uh, and it's still we didn't have a consensus list of the New Testament. It's, and quite frankly, there's still not a consensus list, as you and I know, and I don't think 99% of everybody else does, that there are parts of Oriental Orthodoxy that has never accepted the book of Revelation in the New Testament. So, again, it's this whole American idea that you can just invent Christianity in the American milieu and context without any reference back to its actual origins in time and space. And it's just like the Trinity dropped from the sky. Hmm. Um, virtually every, though there are oneness Pentecostals that don't believe in the Trinity, right? Um, but most Evangelical Christians just take the Trinity for granted. It's like, yeah, you just read the New Testament and it's obvious that the New Trinity. No, it wasn't obvious to the early church. But, uh, the Trinity as we understand it and it's defined. It's the church working in prayer and its liturgical life and its council of its bishops and seeking the Holy Spirit's guidance mm -hmm. finally in council. And it takes, literally takes four councils. It takes Nicaea 325. It takes Constantinople in 381, which added the whole section that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and the Son. And then the Council of Ephesus in 3431 that deals with Mary's role, right? And so they define Mary as Theotokos. Is, is Mary the, did Mary give birth to divinity or did she simply give birth to humanity? Mm. Of course, the answer is she has to have given birth to divinity. So she's not Christokos, just giving birth to the Messiah. She's Theotokos, the God-bearer, because Jesus can only, only have always been God. And these doctrines could only be developed through the, the study and the promulgation of church tradition. They didn't, they didn't just appear in a vacuum. Yeah. And... That's where I think it's always a difficult pill to swallow, talking about the idea of sola scriptura not being the not being a defining article of faith because I've, I've been there and I went through this process when I studied the formation of biblical canon with you, that the initial knee-jerk reaction is that without sola scriptura, you are denying the authority and the divine inspiration of Scripture. Just the opposite. Which is just the opposite, exactly. That church authority is subservient to Scripture, but it was the church, like you said, that existed prior to the closure of scriptural canon and was what transmitted it forward and was able to reach that consensus of the, the Bible which we've received, which is divinely inspired and was divinely compiled through the Holy Spirit's work in the church. And I think that is viewed through that lens just as, if not more supernatural than the idea that it's always just been in the book form that it is, that you've got so many disparate churches scattered across the ancient world that preserved these ancient manuscripts throughout time because they were important and they communicated the truth of God's word and then all came together centuries later still perfectly preserving the truth that God wanted to convey and now gives us the authoritative version of God's word right you know and it's and again you know 
we're not trying to trash um, the I'm Mandela. sympathetic to the position. Yeah, and I th wouldn't it be easy if it was just you and your Bible and you could determine all truth because God reveals everything to you, right? It, first of all, there's just an arrogance to that, that um, you're your own prophet, right? You know, it, it leads ultimately to the Fourth Council, you know, which it wasn't just obvious to the first five centuries of the church that Jesus was perfectly human and perfectly divine. Uh, and the Coptic church still doesn't buy into that, who are, some, to me, are some of the most admirable Christians on earth, uh, the Coptic Christians. They face unbelievable persecution on a daily basis that we couldn't. But yeah, that was what the council came together at Chalcedon in 451, and that completed the eventual quadrangle, if you will, of the Christian church's uh, understanding of Christology. Jesus is perfectly human, perfectly divine. He was always perfectly divine, but he became perfectly human, born of a woman, born under the law, as St. Paul would say in his letter to the Galatians. So I'm not surprised by this statistic. It's just alarming. It is. It, I mean, 73%, three quarters of people, right, who, um, and it only can lead to worse things. Yes. It's just, it's just it's a, a slippery slope. Yeah, it's just all the worms are going to continue to come out of the can. And, it, and eventually, what ha and it's happening. It's happening in Rhode Island. We've talked about it. Staunch congregations that stood for evangelical orthodoxy since their founding pastors here in Rhode Island are slipping in the progressive direction, especially on the sexuality yeah. issues, right? And when your Christology's wrong, all your doctrine will be wrong. All of it. Period. Once you get Christology wrong, everything else will be wrong. To your point, I'd like to share a few other statistics that I thought were noteworthy, although not maybe quite as shocking mm. as the first one, one of which was that more than half, 58%, believe the Holy Spirit is a force, but not a personal being. This is evangelical. This is the same survey. 55% believe, um, so 58% more than half, a correction there, believe that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And then the previous one, 55% it is, believe the Holy Spirit is a force and not a personal being. And then more than half, 55% agree that Everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. So what do those things tell you, Rector? It, it tells me that, I think it tells us the same thing that we were just talking about, that you, you are either, one, not paying attention to what is being taught in your congregation, or two, your congregation is not teaching you the things which are consistent with Orthodox Christian understanding. So you may be preaching about any number of things, but you never get to the meat of the issue as is taught in by scripture and then also put forth by church tradition. These ideas that the idea of original sin, the idea that you know, if there is no original sin and most people are good by nature, then why did Christ come to die for us in the first place? That if the Holy Spirit is a force but not a personal being, what does that say about the character of God? Right. If, if you, God accepts the worship of all religions, then why be a Christian in the first place? Right, you see, and it, it goes back to two things that you and I are well aware of, right? If you don't recite the creed every week, all those things would be debunked. Right. Right, so when you're non-creedal, that you for all the reasons evangelicals don't accept the Nicene Creed because they just think all these truths fell out of heaven and it's been revealed to them, right? You have no mechanism to check and balance false teaching on a weekly basis in your yeah. congregation. And the other thing is the other lack of passing on the tradition of the church in liturgical norm. Lex orande, lex credendi. What I pray is what I believe. Well, you don't really pray anything. You come, you sing a lot, you listen to a good person speak for a long time, uh, but you don't pray systematically of what the things, even the scriptures themselves, demand that we pray about hmm. on a weekly basis in, in a format that is consistent with what the church has always taught. Yes. And so when these things aren't 
affirmed uh, weakly all the other forces that you that consume you 24 7 the other six days are going to overwhelm right. these things and so sunday becomes an outlet for something other than giving worship to the triune god it's it's, it's entertainment it's a, it's a therapy it's therapeutic it's cathartic it's all these things but uh, we in the great tradition you come to church to do one thing give thanks to God for your redemption on Sunday. That is it. <laughs> That's the point of Christian worship. It's got nothing to do with all these other things. And so I think the most telling one is about the idea that the, the Holy Spirit is some like untethered force that just floats around and does what it wants. It's like the force in oh, Star Wars. Yes, it's just... Um, it's obviously incompatible to anything in the Word of God, Scripture, and it's utterly um, foolishness in any place in historic Christian theology. <laughs> you couldn't find it anywhere, right, on any works of any of the patristic fathers on the role of the Holy Spirit inside the Trinity, right? And again, it's just a distortion of Christology. And so therefore, of course, you're going to have bad doctrine. You're going to have what Pentecostalism is. It's a distortion of the Trinity in the how the Godhead works in time and space. Exactly. So I think with all of these statistics that we're discussing, it's important uh, also to understand the generational distinctions. And this is something that we've received good feedback on from our first episode as well that talking about how my experience versus your experience differs uh, has been really helpful for thinking through the issues so I'd like to revisit that again and this time with a more specific question that do you see any patterns or attitudes emerging with regard to everything that we talked about so patterns and attitudes regarding Christian religion, religiosity that are specific to your generation. So think of it in the context of your mother's experience growing up as a Catholic versus your experience and how that has changed over time. Oh, it's changed immensely. In fact, it brings great... Um, I don't want to speak for my mother, but there's, uh, there's certainly discouragement. Uh, in my mother, and my mother was my mother's 80, born in 1942, right? So she's lived through. You know, by the time my mother was 18, Vatican II is starting, right? And so well, there's all that liturgical change that went on all through her 20s, um, and then this evolution of the role. The, the rise of progressive thought uh, in the church. Um, not just a change from the Latin Mass to the vernacular Mass, uh, um, Paul VI Mass. Um, there's been a trail, a domino trail of the lessening of doctrine and um, the authority of the church being watered down, um, almost zero consequences for um, dissent from church teaching. Hmm. You know, from, it began in the 60s with academia, and then it eventually reaches the pulpit, and it reaches the level of the presbyter as the pastor of the local parish. And, um, you know, for my mother's generation, you know, I, I, she can't speak for everybody in that generation. There's plenty of progressives her age, too, right? Yeah. Uh, but for her, and she's articulated this to me, she may have articulated to you. She's, she's uh, been to our congregation. Is that, like, the church left her. She didn't leave the church, mm -hmm. but the church left her. And um, I think that's true of a lot of traditional conservative Protestants yeah. uh, across the spectrum as well. Um, it is a 
um, situation, I think, for people in her generation. It's a lonely place for them. Absolutely. So, yeah. And, um, and I think there's zero sympathy from anybody within 10 to 15 years of her age uh, in the rank and file of the churches. And, um, which in and of itself is outside of the Christian bounds of charity, just uh, under that itself, never mind the fact that uh, the fact that my mother expects a Christian to believe in the Trinity doesn't seem to be too outrageous yeah. of a request, right? And so it's, it's um, bringing comfort to people over 70, 75 is, is difficult in these days. Mm -hmm. And they see it every day in the media, in the church, you look what's going on. Um, obviously, if you were raised an Episcopalian and you had, you were a traditionalist in your perspective of things, and you've watched the Episcopal Church is just not going to exist in 50 years. They can pretend all they want. They know it too. Um, um, neither is the United Church of Christ or the American Baptist Convention, or um, uh, and yet in in all those traditions, as these faithful remnant that uh, stay put because they know nothing else. Right? Yeah. We talked to this about your grandparents, right? Going to the particular Episcopal parish they did. They didn't know any other, uh, but they didn't know they were a frog being boiled in a pot for 50 years. They didn't know it. Nobody ever told them. Father X, you know, he was a sweet person or whoever the next rector was was a sweet person. Um, so the whole idea that not only was the church changing sociologically, but it had changed doctrinally massively, wasn't really part of their awareness in their purview. In their purview. No, and it wasn't really part of their, for that generation, their experience to just pack up and change churches either. It was, it was part of your identity. It was what? almost un unthinkable yeah. culturally, right? Um, and yeah. Would you say that your experience personally as, as a baby boomer has been mostly as a, as a convictional Christian of the baby boomer generation, would you say that your experience has been all that different from that of your mother, which you just described? Or has it been largely similar? I think it's largely similar. It's just a matter of degree. Hmm. Um, you know, obviously my mother, um, and my father too I mean they're not uh, unintelligent people but they're not theologians they, you know, they weren't trained theologians and they weren't myopic like me about uh, a whole bunch of things and, um, but absolutely and I think it's driven my career and my, I don't like that word career my vocation as, uh, as both as a baptized confirmed Christian and as an ordained person uh, I just, I'm unwilling to compromise the things I made promises to uphold. And it became pretty obvious early in my ordained career, my ordained life uh, as a priest, that that wasn't going to uh, make me ascend the ladder of the hierarchy mm. in the church, right? And so you have to make a valid decision a long time ago. Um, what are you willing to give up for Christ? And I mean, I just say this because it's factual about my life. I gave up everything, right? So I gave up my pension. I gave up my living. Um, I gave, uh, I was canceled by dozens of people and friends, and I, uh, the media really loved me. Mm. Uh, I received boxes of hate mail from dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And there's a cost to following Christ and carrying your cross, this precious few that will do it. And reminded of a quote from the wife of Richard Vermbrand after World War II when the Soviets were coming through and rounding up the, the Congress of Religious Peoples. I forget the word that they used. And they were parading around public officials and, and priests and religious, reader, religious leaders at this conference and causing them, forcing them to go up one by one and support the political 
hierarchy, the communist ideology of the Soviet Union, one by one, essentially renouncing their faith. And when it became Richard Wurmbrand's turn to go up and do the same, his wife said to him, essentially, go up there and wipe the dirt off the face of Christ. And his response to her was, if I do that, I'll lose everything. And what his wife told him was, I would rather have nothing than a husband who is a coward. God bless her. Right. And so he went on, and of course he founded Voice of the Martyrs, but right. um, that's the type of courage that we are required to have. Yeah, um, what's our friend, the German um, famous pastor, died in the concentration camp? Um, oh, um, huh. yeah, I'm drawing, a, I'm drawing a blank. We should <laughs> Yeah, he's the most know. famous guy out there. Um, but th that type, people love to quote him. Right, I've heard evangelicals quote yeah. them, and everybody quotes them. And um, but it's like all our heroes. Who's really willing to emulate them? Right? We're caught. Right. Ultimately, we're caused to emulate Christ and the apostles. I, I don't see many bishops emulating Christ and the apostles. No. Right? Um, I, I've I've been met a handful of men in the ordained ministry that I would ever line up behind in battle. They couldn't lead, in my opinion, they couldn't lead the Bride of Christ on a leave across a wet mud puddle. And um, the statements like that put me where I am <laughs> yeah. in my life, you know? And um, It wasn't Bonhoeffer. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It was it Bonhoeffer? Yeah, Dietrich okay. Bonhoeffer, yeah. You know, famously, Dietrich was early when he had been arrested by the Gestapo when he was in prison and one of Lutheran pastors who he had known you know throughout his years in the ministry but they came to him to see him in prison and, and they asked Bonhoeffer he says you know Dietrich what are you doing in there basically like if you just shut up and behave and don't you know make all this ruckus they'll let you out and and you know you can be safe, and you might survive the war. But for Bonhoeffer, that was like a dumbest question because Bonhoeffer's response was simply this: the question isn't what I'm doing in here, brother. The question is, what are you doing out there? Yeah. And it's no different for you and I. That's 1942, whatever it was, and we're in 2022. It's not any different. Right. The question isn't why are you two not conforming to the norms of this culture, and well, we should be saying, and I think we both do, is that's not the question. The question is, why do you conform to the norms of this culture? Mm. And the other person who was on my mind in that conversation was uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe oh. as well. Exactly. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> so he was the one in the concentration camp, and it was the, the shovel that was stolen, I yes. think, and so the Nazis had lined everyone up to yes. find out who had done it. And he stepped forward and said... You know what? It was me. Take me. Yeah, and he, he knew it wasn't him, and they were going to, I think it was either a, a father or it a was mother. Like a fa yeah, it was a parent. Of, of, and had a child in the camp, and he just, and it wasn't a thing that he had contemplated for weeks. He no. did it just like that. Uh, you know, unbelievable priest, right? The, see, that's the exultimate example of persona Christi, of his understanding of the priesthood, right? He takes the place of Christ amongst the amongst the flock and even when the flock's in this horrific most 20th the ultimate example 20th century hell yeah and still you know his belief in Christ is so strong he's willing to die and he was injected with poison mm. and killed and uh, but that person's life was he saved temporarily um, the greatest love anyone has is to lay down their life for their friends yes and um I, I don't meet a lot of people like that, do you? They're rare. They're hard to come by. Right. So uh, from, my expected, from my perspective, I, I think you can see that remnant be passed on. That remnant of faithful Christians exists throughout the generations, but the, the size of the congregation around them, let's say, grows 
smaller. And so I think we're fast approaching a critical mass where, yes, yes the number of people who identify with the Christian faith has gone down, but that remnant has remained and that remnant has grown stronger. And so thinking about millennial and Gen Z in contrast to baby boomer and greatest generation is that, yes, there is a, there are far fewer people who are familiar with the Christian faith, far fewer people who identify with the Christian faith. Church attendance is down in large parts, but from the friends that I've made in campus ministry especially and elsewhere, those of my generation are far stronger in their convictions and in their faith, and they are very devout. So those people who identify as Christians now, I would say a much higher percentage in those younger generations, at least from my point of view, I think are, that's, no, I are think far you, more devout. I think it's, uh, that's true. Um, because just to identify yourself publicly as a Christian in any real sense it is, takes vastly more courage than it did for the Xers or the Boomers, right? right. And so um, you and your brother are examples of that. Your wedding was an example of that. His wedding was an example of that, right? The, the friends that came to your weddings, I was so impressed with these young people because they're, it's utterly different than the weddings I ever went to yeah. for my generation. Uh, that maybe being a handful of people actually believed anything when they went to the church. Of course, you know, the pattern's been for 20 years. Even your friends, they don't even show up at the church ceremony. They only show up at the uh, yeah, reception. The party. Right. And that, that's how disconnected they are from the whole sacramental reality of what marriage is. That they could care less about it. Right. But uh, your wedding in particular, I was just so impressed with your friends from WPI and that Christian fellowship that these were clearly people in their early to mid 20s who were convicted in, and um, committed to the gospel. And these are uh, brilliant engineer types. And, um, but they were going to carry that faith into their professional life. Yeah, and they and, drove a long way to and, do it. We got and, married out in the middle of nowhere right. and they still came. And wherever it took them in their professional life, they're willing to take the consequences of it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and they're taking their faith with them right now. It's, it's ultimately the mark of a man and a woman who, who, who claims to be a follower of Christ. Um, I think that's it's it's almost impossible for the normative person in our culture here in Rhode Island, in America, to to comprehend why you would give up anything, Father Galloway. Why would you give up your job? Why would you give up? Why would you give that up? You know, uh, the Episcopal Church's pensions were the most lucrative in all the established. I mean, it was funded by Carnegie back in the 20th century. It's uh, it's staggering. We're at 40 minutes. You can finish that thought. Though. And um, they they just don't get it. They didn't get me at all. They were like, I would never do that. And I'm like, that's clear you would never do that. That's not the question for me. The question is what, should, what is my conscience and my faith tell me I should do? Right, and it can only be understood through that lens of right. faith. So. And um, I think even in the church you guys grew up in, um, as you know, successful as a 10-year run was there, there was always people who came to our church that weren't sure I was totally crazy. Yeah. Right, because they like the idea of its orthodoxy and so forth, but I think they were very tenuous about the idea. Does he or does the leadership really expect us to be this bold and this brave? Y yes. So I think that's a good place to finish up. One last thought that I want to leave us with for this episode is we're going to release sometime around the new year, and with it comes all sorts of New Year's resolutions, people making pronouncements about what they're going to do in the new year. What are your thoughts on New Year's resolutions, Mark? Uh, I have to admit, I, I have made them uh, in the course of earlier in my life, and I, they're really silly, <laughs> I think. Um, the new year for a Christian begins on the first Sunday of Advent, not on January 31st. And our resolutions should be uh, things that don't come around every uh, 
first day of the secular year. They should be something that's motivated out of our prayer life that continually dictates to our conscience what we should be about. Wouldn't it be something if we made Christian New Year's resolutions on the first Sunday of Advent as opposed to the yeah, start I've of actually, the calendar year? I've actually done that. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember when I was rector of St. Mary's, I had uh, a year where I said, that's what we're going to do. And of course, people were scratching their, <laughs> scratching their heads. But uh, um, yeah, I, I think we have to, it's not even radical thought, really, is it? But I think we have to be inventive and creative again to try to get into to jaw the conscience of, yeah. of the average Christian. I think most New Year's resolutions traditionally aren't kept, but I think they do point to a deeper reality, which, like you said, is instructive for us as Christians to be able to set a goal and seek to achieve it with the help of the Holy Spirit, constantly striving to increase in holiness. Absolutely. I agree with that. Yep. So I think that'll do it for us today. Uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us for today's conversation. Please, if you haven't already, like, subscribe, and leave a five-star rating if you enjoyed the show. It means a lot to us, and it goes a long way to help us growing this podcast. So with that, we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.